Just a few weeks ago, the Navy admitted for the first time that several UFO videos were real, meaning they show actual area phenomenon. But so far, the Pentagon. Can you hear us? I can hear you loud and clear. Yes, sir. Awesome. Okay, good. And we can hear you. Yeah, so, loud, uh, yeah. so nice to meet you. I'm Anja Andersen. I'm professor at the Niels Bohr Institute. Yeah, and we have uh, Søren Sørensen as well. Yes, my name is Søren. I'm a major in the Danish Air Force. I'm a former F-16 pilot. I flew F-16 for 20 years. And uh, Excellent aircraft. Excellent General aircraft. dynamic. Excellent. That's a very, very, one of the most highly maneuverable aircraft that uh, that uh, that is out there right now. I agree totally. It was awesome. <laughs> I'm very excited that you you wanted to to do this with us. I'm not I'm not actually really sure how uh, we got it uh, we we got the deal with you because I, I received an email from uh, from your wife, uh, but yeah. I I I I, uh, I gave my email to 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 uh, some guys in the in the UFO community. Maybe that's how it happened. Well, you know, it's funny. I'm not really into the UFO community. Uh, my background has always been national security. Um, I, uh, I had someone, um, forward me, uh, actually, believe it or not, that's in the government forwarded me your, uh, your email request. So, okay. uh, he's definitely not, uh, he was not in the UFO community. So wow. somehow someone knows who you are. <laughs> that, that's uh, both um, amazing and a little bit scary. Just maybe if for the listeners that we have that are maybe not so much into UFOs and UAPs and and doesn't know the whole uh, Pentagon uh, saga right now, uh, can you explain to listeners who you are and what your role was uh, in the government? My name is Luis uh, Elizondo, and I'm a career uh, intelligence uh, officer with the United States government. Also spent some time working uh, in uniform uh, as a member of our armed services, specifically with the Army. And I've uh, I've been in intelligence my entire career. In 2008, I was asked by uh, by the then director of the of the government's UFO program at the Pentagon to provide support to this very small but secretive organization that very few people knew about. In 2010, when the former director left, vacated his position, I was asked to assume the responsibilities for for running this program Uh, this program was called the advanced aerospace threat identification program otherwise known as atip and i served as as its supervisor slash director uh until 2017 when i resigned my position um because of over secrecy and too many um complications bureaucratic challenges to this effort Uh, for those who don't know what atip was It was the Pentagon's effort to study UFOs. Mm-hmm. UFOs uh, have been, uh, we, we, we tend to use the, the new definition of UAP, unidentified aerial phenomena versus unidentified flying objects, um, for two reasons, but primarily because of the stigma and taboo that has been historically associated with, uh, with the topic of UFOs. And and just to be clear, so you you quit the uh, your job uh, yourself, and um, you said for bureaucratic reasons. Is didn't you feel the the needed support? Um, I I well yes and no. Uh, because the program was so secretive, I was prohibited from telling most people in my chain of command uh, of what our what our activities were. Uh, I was only allowed to brief at the very highest levels. But when I say the highest levels. Uh, with exception of the Secretary of Defense. At the time, uh, Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, uh, who was at one point a, a, a general for the Marine Corps uh, and a very successful general, was an individual whom I've had the distinct honor to serve with in combat. And I've known this individual to be a very serious military leader. And unfortunately, in my time at ATIP, the, the people right below him were preventing me from briefing him on the topic. Um, and for me, that was a mistake. We we had overwhelming evidence that these 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 objects indeed were in our airspace and potentially interfering with our military air operations. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you're not allowed to tell the Secretary of Defense what's going on, I think that's problematic. Furthermore, we had been paid $22 million dollars of taxpayer money to try to solve this problem. And at the end of the day, we weren't successful in being able to brief the one person in the government who needed to know. 
Well, uh, now you have the establishment within the United States government, an official UAP task force, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force. Let's not make the mistake of saying that UAP are aircraft or missiles or drones. Otherwise, we'd call them unidentified, you know, (laughs) aircraft (laughs) task force. This is the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force, and it has been established specifically directly under the Deputy Secretary of Defense. So that's very important because now the government is signaling to the world that we are finally taking this topic seriously to the point we're creating a new capability to to research and study and find answers about this phenomenon. Um, I think we are also beginning to see an increase in international interest. Japan has recently signed on with the United States to share information specifically about UAPs, but there's other countries as well as South America and Europe that are beginning to signal their willingness to cooperate with the United States government. And I suspect they're doing this because they have their own instances of UAPs in their country. Uh, so we have been working very diligently for the last three years, um, my, my partners and I, to try to raise awareness of this issue. Uh, we have been focusing on five major pillars, if you will, of, of, of interest. And that is the first pillar of effort is our engagement with the legislative legislative branch, our elected officials in office. And then the, uh, the next area of emphasis, the second area of emphasis has been engaging the executive branch, our, our, our leaders who are appointed into those positions uh, to, to make decisions like secretaries of defense, et cetera. The third area of emphasis has been international engagement, working with our friends and allies uh, to see if they would be willing and interested to, to, to collaborate and cooperate with us. The fourth area of interest uh, for us, uh, our our major emphasis has been media engagement, engaging all areas of the media. Uh, So now the media feels it's okay to have this conversation, uh, that it's not a a laughing matter. And then last but not least, um, it's it's public engagement. Uh, Our our area of emphasis has been engaging the, the, the public writ large and letting them understand that the the stigma and taboo that has been typically assigned to this topic is really been hurting our ability to really study this phenomenon. And when I say study, I mean study it from a, not from a ufological perspective, I mean from a scientific perspective, using the scientific principles and methodologies that we're all used to, such as peer review and repeatable experiments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So are you part of the task force? Or are you just uh, uh, I, a, a private somehow still interested in the... Course, uh, ma'am, I am not uh, officially part of the task force. Um, I, I I am no longer employed by the U.S. government in that capacity, but uh, I, I I certainly will facilitate um, this effort uh, any way I can, whether it be for the private citizens or uh, or the U.S. government. So, how many people are part of the task force? Because it sounds like a huge task, right? You mentioned lots of different ways that one needs to work in order for the task force to succeed. So, is it is it, it is a it is a huge task with a very small number of people, unfortunately, and therein lies the problem. What we need to do is is take this this small construct, this exploratory body called the task force. And in my opinion, I think we need to make it a more enduring, more permanent capability resourced properly. Um, the problem with this topic is that it is it is one of the greatest enigmas that we, from a national security perspective, face, and yet it is one of the, the most minimally resourced areas. Uh, and I think it's it's probably partly because of the national security infrastructure in my country. Uh, we are very, very good at identifying traditional and conventional threats. But when you have something like this that falls well beyond uh, the normal definition of national security issue, uh, it becomes much more difficult. And so what they have done is establish a task force within the U.S. government, within the Department of Defense apparatus. I, I'm not certain that is the most appropriate place. I think... Uh, Lessons being learned. Um, I think we need to take a whole of government approach. I think we need an effort that is long term and that is now residing not just within the Department of Defense, but has participation from the intelligence community, our Homeland Security, our our FAA, uh, which is our our 
uh, Federal Aviation Administration. I think we need to have academia and scientists involved, um, both in the in the public and private sector. I think this is a, an enormous an enormous endeavor that's going to require uh, a lot of a lot of people. In the last three years, you have the U.S. government uh, releasing videos officially saying that there are unidentified aerial phenomena. You have the government uh, briefing Congress, our Congress at the classified level, uh, about the reality of the UAP issue. Uh, you have Congress, therefore, coming out of these briefings and unanimously claiming that this is a national security issue and that we need to learn, we need to learn more about it. Then you have the creation of an actual UAP task force under, very publicly, by the way, under the, the Deputy Secretary of Defense. And now you have a 180-day report due to Congress from none other, none other than our Director of National Intelligence, our senior intelligence officer in our country, owes a report to Congress about this topic. So I think that alone, if you look at that in the last three years, was a monumental achievement in being able to overcome the stigma and taboo associated with this topic. But I still think we have a long way to go. Um, I think it was a, a, an excellent gesture of good faith uh, to try to find answers. But uh, I, I don't think that the task force in its current construct is prepared to answer Congress's questions and therefore the people's questions, the people that, that put those elected officials in Congress are really just a representation of us as, as the private citizen. And so if the private citizen wants real answers, we're going to have to put real resources and real personnel um, behind, behind this, uh, this effort. If, if we can talk a little bit about uh, the videos, of course, because they were kind of the, the whole reason why we did this podcast was the, it seemed like so much uh, was evolving uh, within talking about UFOs and UAPs. And I showed the one of the first episodes. I showed the videos to uh, Søren Sørensen, a fighter pilot who's sitting here next to me. And he was, uh, I mean, he knew what, what he was looking at, and he knew that something really weird was going on. Um, so, and, uh, how did you feel first time you saw these videos? Because for a lot of people, this may not seem like, you know, that hardcore evidence that 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 we need. No, uh, I was amazed. I've seen a lot of videos, uh, all of them with aircraft on it, and this was definitely not an aircraft. The way it it flew uh, I, aerodynamically, it was a disaster, but it flew uh, perfectly. Uh, Propulsion-wise, we couldn't see uh, what was the, the engine in the, in this machine or whatever it was. So yeah. I, I was amazed the way uh, the pattern it flew and uh, the performance it had. And I know, Louis, that you talked to a lot of pilots and uh, ex-military uh, people who saw similar things. Like, how how often is this uh, occurring? I think it's it, people would be surprised to learn that it's occurring a lot more frequently than people might expect. Um, let's not forget that, like your 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 friend here, who has been 20 years experience behind the, the stick of an F-16. These are individuals who are highly trained to recognize enemy and friendly aircraft from miles away. So whether it's an SU-22 or a MiG-25 or a European Tornado or an F-16, all these aircraft have specific silhouettes. They all have specific performance characteristics and envelopes from which they, they can they can maneuver. And in this particular case, what most people don't realize by looking at these videos is that it's not just the videos. It is the eyewitness testimony with the human being, which is also an intelligence collection sensor in itself. Mm -hmm. You also have radar returns. You have multiple electro-optical hits on this. So you now have, you know, three, it's not, this is not just eyewitness testimony. These are three separate intelligence collection systems that are all reporting the same information at the same time, at the same place, under the same circumstances. Now you have very compelling information because you can begin to triangulate performance attributes that maybe the human eye or just a radar or just a camera wouldn't be able to pick up. And when all these 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 data points are pointing to the same to the same thing, now you have very compelling information. And I think when people look at the videos, they misconstrue those videos saying, well, there's nothing to see here. Well, actually there's a lot if you know what you're looking at. And more importantly, that there's other 
other collection sensors out there that are reinforcing what the pilots are seeing. So this is not a case of where maybe your grandmother saw some lights in the backyard. <laughs> these are highly trained experts that in some cases are being tasked to pursue these things. And the performance characteristics are really beyond anything that, that we have really been able to experience before from a conventional aircraft perspective. Um, so it is, it is very compelling. And by the way, I think the public should recognize it's not just those three videos. There's many, many, many other videos. Some of them are far more compelling um, that uh, at this point the DOD has decided not to release. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's important to put that into context. And this is nothing new. This is not a, this is not a U.S. phenomenon. Mm -hmm. This is something that our international friends and allies have been seeing for years and years and years, if not decades. And it continues to be, be very perplexing. Um, even, even right now over, over, over Europe, a, a lot of these things are being picked up, not just by civilian aircraft, but by military aircraft and even, even passenger aircraft, um, or people now with cell phones are being able to, <laughs> to record some of these things that are pretty, pretty fascinating. It's amazing. I mean, but I mean, have you seen something that, that just made you, made your, I mean, that really, really amazed you, uh, other than these these videos that there seem to be more of? I mean, are there any? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's The evidence is much, much, there's much better evidence uh, that has not been released yet that I think would be, for most people, um, concrete proof that these are are very much real and they are very much in our airspace. Wow. There's only three op op options it can be. It's either some sort of secret U.S. technology, uh, or it is some sort of foreign adversarial technology, or it's something completely different. And we as a country are, are absolutely certain it's not our own technology. For mm -hmm. reasons that if you want, I can explain at some point. We are almost absolutely certain that it's not foreign technology. So that only leaves one other option. If it's not ours then it must be something else. Wow. So when you say there's a lot of sightings, is it like that people report in several times per year or is it like once per month or once per week? Or what is what is uh, often? Well, it's it's uh, it's like a car crash. Sometimes uh, you can go for weeks without a car crash being reported on the highway. And then other times you might have three or four reported in a day. Um uh, It, there was no such thing as a typical day in ATIP. Um, sometimes when we would be out on a uh, on a naval exercise, there'd be multiple reports, multiple hits in, in a week, um, a lot, actually. And then in other cases, uh, if you weren't uh, doing any maneuvers and you were just uh, back at, at you know, at, uh, wherever your, your base is, Navy base is located, um, you know, the frequency may, may drop off mm -hmm. significantly. So I guess my my answer to that, to try to be as accurate as possible, there wasn't any clear steady state of reporting. It was it was truly dependent upon, to some degree, in, at what maybe what we were doing, uh, that, that the UAP incidents may actually be a response to our own operations and exercises. And and feel free to to better my question or, or or join here. How 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 is this possible? How what is happening here? Do we do we have to think about physics in a in a completely alternative way? In order no, to I don't. I think I, I, yeah, no, I don't think so. I don't think these are defying the laws of physics at all. Uh, the laws of physics are, are the laws of physics for a reason. I think we need to do is adjust our understanding of the laws of physics. You know, we we all remember as, as kids learning about Newtonian physics and science um, during the Great Renaissance and how, you know, the apple falls from the tree and that's our model for gravity. And then along comes last century, a, a gentleman named Albert Einstein, who completely changed our understanding of space time and the universe we live in. And now we recognize that space time is actually indeed flexible. Uh, both with massive objects and super energetic objects can actually bend and, and flex space time. And then 30 years ago, of course, we begin to learn this entirely new paradigm of physics uh, where we can actually now do some of the experimentation to prove it 
which is quantum physics. And this is physics that is completely alien to us, that seems to be diametrically opposed in some cases to Newtonian physics, and yet it's very real. And it is a, it is a very real part of the universe in which we live in, if not perhaps the most fundamentally true aspect of our universe is really quantum physics. And so at, as tough as it is to, to understand, um, we have learned more in the last 30 years and perhaps the last 300 years about this new, new way the universe operates. I think the alarm bells have been sounded. I just think that uh, the halls are very big and very long, and so the public doesn't necessarily hear those alarm bells. But again, if you look at the, what the government has done in the last three years, you'll begin to realize that it is very much taking these, these things very seriously. Um, and it takes time. You know, It takes time to, as I tell people, to eat an elephant. You can't eat an elephant in one bite. You'll, you'll choke. You need, you need time to, to digest it and to... Uh, you know, understand what it is we're dealing with here. This is, you're right, the United States takes all potential threats very seriously. And it turns out that we haven't been taking this one very seriously for a very long time. So there's a little bit of a learning curve. And then there's also uh, a little bit of public messaging, I think, uh, that's, that's very important. Um, you know, all governments are responsible for the safety and security of its people. And so this is no different case. If you have something that can fly in our airspace without impunity uh, and outperform anything and everything that we have in our current inventory, that's a problem. But at the same time, you don't want to instill panic. This is, this is, these things have been here for a very long time um, to the best of our understanding. And so there's no need to have an overreaction. I think, you know, in this case, we need to have cool, calm, rational discussion within the scientific community to better understand what we're dealing with here. Do you know, have you heard anything about a plan in motion? We did an episode here where we kind of, we had some experts from Denmark. We kind of, we kind of tried to, uh, to, to run the experiment. What would happen if they actually came? If, you know, they became hostile or um, too many of them came at one time or we, we felt, in, you know, unsafe. Is there any plan in order from within the American government? Uh, you know, I, I, unfortunately, I cannot answer that question. Sure. Um, uh, there have been been studies in the past, but I cannot comment right now um, if uh, if there's a, a current threat assessment being produced. Of course. I, I'm I'm working that right now with some of my colleagues. Uh, that very issue. Um, Remember what I said our, our, our third pillar was of emphasis was international engagement. Yeah. And I think uh, it's safe to say that at some point we're going to need some sort of international body, whether it's NATO or the United Nations or someone like that, to, to pick up the baton and have a conversation internationally. I do not think this is just a U- U.S. phenomenon. I think this is truly a global phenomenon that requires a global conversation. Um, and and let let the people have that conversation and let them be part of the the calculus to find the answers. But this is a United Nation Office of Outer Space Affairs, I think it's called, right? Which is uh, situated in Switzerland or something. Um, yeah, but I think yeah. only contains like three people or something. But where they do think about what are we going to do um, yeah. if the alien lands and who's going to say hi and and things. But, you know, I, I think that's a really what you say there is very interesting, because I think as human beings, we tend to to look at this problem that if it's not from Earth, then it must be from outer space. And I think I, one of the things I would challenge your listeners to do is reevaluate that just because something may not be here from Earth doesn't necessarily mean it's from outer space. I think I think, as I've told people before, uh, you know, it, it's there's possibilities it could be from you know, outer space, inner space, or the space in between. Um, there's a lot about our universe we're beginning to realize that isn't necessarily spatial temporal. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be something from, let's say, the Pleiades or Alpha Proxima. Um, the universe, as we have seen through the, the modeling of quantum physics, is much more complicated than that. Um, there are 
there are realities around us uh, that we don't necessarily interact with, but they're very real and they're all around us all the time. And I think uh, we as a species need to challenge ourselves from the current paradigm of if they're not from here, they're from outer space. I mean, they could be at the end of the day, it, they could be, but but we don't know. It, it could There could be many, many other options there that I think are, are, are worthy of exploration and scientific study. I agree with it. That's a very interesting point. Do you know if there is any like bait bait strategy in order uh, something to kind of uh, get these vehicle uh, out in the open so that we can study them because how do we i mean when when we don't know when we can come across these uh, vehicles it's 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 much harder to uh, to take a step forward but if we could find some sort of system to kind of get them out in the open maybe it would be uh, easier to 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 look at them that is absolutely an excellent excellent question a question that we have been diligently trying to answer but unfortunately a question that i cannot answer at this time um we do believe that there are some commonalities um but that's about as far as i'm prepared to talk about at this point uh regarding uh as you will baiting or luring luring something out okay Have you ever, uh, Lou, observed a, a, a UFO yourself? I don't think I've ever heard you answer that question. You probably have, though. <laughs> uh, I, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't want to mix my own personal experiences, what I might or might not have had, um, into the calculus. I'm very careful to try to maintain the scientific integrity of this effort by not introducing any of my own personal observations that I may or may not have had. Yeah. Uh, it's important to, as an investigator, I remain fair, I remain objective. And I, the, the worst thing I could do for your listeners would be to provide some sort of personal anecdote because that might wind up um, clouding the objectivity of, of your audience. And I'm very careful. It, it's important we maintain the integrity of this effort including my own personal bias and opinions. Uh, mm. At the end of the day, what doesn't ma- it doesn't matter what I think or believe. What matters is what the facts and the data says and ultimately what, what, what you, your audience, think. Let me ask you or, or anybody in your audience, when's the last time you saw an American nuclear submarine? Well, probably not very often, you know? <laughs> That's because they're, they're, they're under the water and they remain hidden for a reason. Yeah. Uh, they are elusive because of that fact that their, their mission and their purpose is to remain elusive. Um, when you are looking at, let me give you another example in nature. When you are looking at fish in a pond, uh, when you are standing on top of the water, they appear distorted. They is, uh, appear kind of weird. Well, it's not that the fish itself are distorted. What's happening is that it is an artifact of the fact that light is behaving differently when it hits the surface of the water. So the 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 light that goes into the water is not necessarily going to be exactly at the same frequency that comes back and reflects in your eye. And you get this image of distortion. And it's possible that you can create that distortion um, in a localized area. If you had the technology, let's say, to warp space time even a little bit, It would be an awful lot like looking at koi fish in a pond. The object that is inside that bubble would appear distorted. In fact, the more gravitational warping you do, the greater that image is distorted till eventually you have that of like a black hole where you can't see anything inside of it at all beyond that of that horizon because space time has been warped and, and, and extruded so, so, so dramatically that it, it almost the concept of space time almost doesn't even make sense anymore. So I guess my point is if you had the technology uh, to warp space time in a localized area, even a little bit, that the image that you would be seeing inside would probably look very weird and distorted. And that would be true for, for even radar uh, systems, electro optical systems, and even the human eye. You know, I, 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 I don't want to, I don't want to be carrying the torch for this conversation any longer than I have to because it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to everybody. And I think 
once this topic is finally taken seriously and internationally discussed, then yes, I would very much like to return to a normal life and, and allow smarter people than me uh, to, to handle this problem. Um, you know, it, it should not be on the shoulders of one person. And that is part of my, if you will, my, my angst, um, mm-hmm. that, that so far it is only a few people that are, are, are responsible for pushing this topic forward. And that should never be the case. Um, I think, I think, I mean, frankly, I'm not qualified. I simply don't have the qualifications. I'm not an astrophysicist, you know. I'm not a a, a 50 year mathematician or, or, or academic. I'm just a, a former intelligence officer doing his job, and so as a result, um, you know, I, I'm probably not the right guy to 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 take this conversation to the next level. Um, but unfortunately, that's exactly the position I find myself in. That's the classic Hollywood movie, right? It's it's rarely the astrophysicist uh, <laughs> that that's uh, put in the main position. It's uh, it's always someone more relatable. I think uh, you know. Hopefully, if, if we can get this across the line on an international scale, we'll be much better off. Luis Elizondo, thank you so much for uh, being so generous with your time, and uh, it's it's been really awesome to talk to you. Very in uh, very informative. Sir, truly my pleasure to to you and your your co-hosts. Thank you for having me, and thank you to your to your patient uh, audience as well. It's 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 most appreciated. Thank you for having me.